Let's turn that. There we go. Last time we introduced evolution. Today we're going to talk in a kind of a little bit of a history lesson to start with. Um, the first slide. I don't want you to really write down anything. I don't think there's anything that important. There'll be one thing. It's actually one of the major concepts about evolution. What I want to do today is give you an introduction to the idea. Okay, the idea. So in any discussion about evolution, we have to start with this guy, Charles Darwin. Because Charles Darwin is like the person who everybody associates with evolution. And some people consider Charles Darwin some kind of evil person, but as you can see, he wasn't. Look at him. Doesn't he look like a really nice guy? He was. He was actually, uh, well... And it's official title, and again, you don't have to write this down, because you're not going to be asked to regurgitate this material, or say it again on a test or anything. He was an English naturalist. That, what a naturalist was, okay, we're, we're talking about what I don't have on here are dates, but we're talking about the 1800s, is when Darwin lived. Back then, when he lived, they didn't have cameras, um, they didn't have anything like that, so... Uh, what a naturalist was, was a person who would go uh, into the wild, if you would, and observe organisms in their environment and either write about them or draw and write about them. Because if you think about it back, if you lived in the 1800s, how would you know about, King? let's say you lived in England, how would you know what a kangaroo was? Well, somebody went to Australia, saw a kangaroo, drew it, and then made a book about Organisms of Australia, for instance. Okay, the printing press had been invented about 300 years before, but if you think about how things got distributed around the world back then, it wasn't quite as instant as it is today. Okay, or even as instant as it was when I was in school before the internet was invented. So, uh, so back then, that's how they learned about things. They had people like him. Now, he did that on the side, and the, what he was really in school for was he was in school to be a preacher. He was in seminary. And uh, we'll talk in a minute about why, what happened. But, well, here's one thing that happened. Was he was invited, he was invited in, in 1850-ish uh, to go on a trip around the world on a boat. Now, if you think about this, he's about 21, 22 years old. He's not married. This is a pretty cool adventure. You get invited, you get paid to go on a trip around the world. Now what they did in these trips was they would take, they would get um, like a captain of a boat would say, all right, he'd go around to different people and he'd say, all right, I want to take a trip around the world and I want you to pay for it. He'd go to like rich people and stuff and what they would do is they would pay for it and then what, they would, what he would give them is a percentage of the profits he made. So let's say he goes to South America and he gets uh, some cocoa. Okay, and he brings it back. And now they have stuff to make coffee with in England because cocoa is South America. So he goes to South America, gets a bunch of cocoa, brings it back. Whatever he sells it for, he would give the people that paid for his trip some of the profits. That's the idea. It's called being a shareholder or something. Well, the other thing they would do is they would take people like Darwin along to look at organisms that live there, draw about them, collect them, write about them, and then make textbooks and sell the textbooks. And so the ship, if you will, the captain whose idea it was to take the trip would get part of the profits and so would all the people that bought it. Is this making any sense to you? So that's how they did it back in the day. So here's Darwin. He's in seminary school and he's got a buddy that knows that he loves animals and he likes to draw about them in plants. And so he invites him on the trip. And Darwin's like, I'm on. I'm on board. I'm going. So... They took a trip around the world, and I, the book, your textbook goes into great gory detail about this, and I'm not going to, but basically they stopped in South America, they started out by going from England to South America, around South America, west to Africa, around Africa, and then back to England. So they really took a trip around the southern part of the world. They didn't make it to North America at all, they didn't make it to, because mostly because those places had been explored. 
Like England and North America obviously knew a lot about each other. Okay, because by the way, that's what the Revolutionary War was all about. So that wasn't a big deal. So they went the southern route. And there's a picture on a page, I'm not sure what page, like 400 ish in your book, that shows about their trip. When you're on a boat for a long time, you have a lot of time to think. And Darwin's on this trip, and one of the things he noticed was that if you were to go to, Aus when they went stopped in Australia, there are kangaroos there. Why don't they live in England? In some places in Australia, the environment, environment is pretty much the same. It's not always warm. They have winter. It's just in a different time of year. And there are no, or you stopped in Africa and you saw lions. And you're like, well, it's really warm in Africa. Not all parts of Africa. There are some parts of Africa where it gets pretty cold. And lions live there too. And he's like, that's weird. Why are there different organisms on different continents? I don't get it. If now what got him really started thinking about this was not just that. He's on this trip and it takes like weeks to cross the Atlantic Ocean in a boat. So what do you do? You read and do things like that. So he's reading books by guys uh, that wrote about like the age of the earth. And is the earth really six thousand years old? Because we find all these things, and he's reading about dinosaurs. And all these guys, right about this time that Darwin was going on this trip is when they started finding dinosaur fossils. And there was no evidence that any of these things ever lived with humans because there would be dead people in their rib cages, right? If you had a dead dinosaur, and you find a dead dinosaur, a huge one like a T-Rex, you would expect that one of the T-Rexes you find would have human bones associated with it. Because it, maybe it was its last meal was the lawyer in Jurassic Park, right, where he snatched the lawyer out and maybe that was his last meal and they shot the T-Rex, boom, he died. But no, there's no evidence of a human living with a dinosaur. And he thought, that's kind of weird. So now that you have that, you have all this, all these things that are different all over the world. And so, when it, here's why Darwin is famous. And you should know the name of this book, and I don't care if you write it down again, it's also in your major concepts. Uh, we abbreviate it nowadays to be just Origin of Species. But the book was titled, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. It was the title. On the origin of species, I mean some natural selection. That doesn't seem like such a big deal. Well, it seems that in the world today, anybody that writes a book about religion that is different from what most people think makes people go crazy a little bit. This isn't really about religion. He says, basically, origin is beginning. Species are animals. We're all living things. How did all living things get here? He says, by his book was, by means of something called natural selection. Back then it was by means of God, right? Creation, boom, here are all the organisms we have. And... His book stated, no, not really. Not really. His book stated that it was natural selection. That's how organisms got here. So let's talk about that in a minute. Where do you get that? All right. This you should know. So in order to come up with a theory of natural selection, you have to have some basis for it. Let me give you the basic underlying idea. And here it is. The basic underlying idea starts with this. First of all, Living things, organisms, have more babies than survive to be adults. For example, something like a rainbow trout lays 10,000 eggs. 10,000. In 
Anybody have a caffeinated kittens recently? How many? Two kittens? That's it? Has she had kittens before? No, so it's her first litter. Anybody have a dog that had puppies recently? Do you know how many puppies come in a litter? You know, German Shepherd person, how many puppies in a litter? Ten? That's a lot. Why do dogs have so many babies? Why do cats have so many babies? Well, here's the second thing he noticed. Is that generally, now we're not talking about things that humans take care of, like puppies and kittens. <coughs> Especially for something like a trout, their population size doesn't change a whole lot. So if you were to take a, make a quick graph with the size of the population over time, you get something that looks like this. Where it's at this carrying capacity and the population size just doesn't change very much. Okay, we have to think back to ecology. If population size doesn't change very much, what must be true about birth rate and death rate? They have to be the same. Okay, hold on a second. So if that's true, how many of these rainbow trout babies, how many of these 10,000 eggs would make it to be an adult? Half? 5,000? Less. Huh? Less. Population size isn't changing. How many rainbow trout does it take to make a baby? Wrong. It's called sexual reproduction, Spencer. Two. So how many of these are going to make it? If the population size isn't changing, two are going to make it to where they can reproduce and have their own. So if you're a rainbow trout egg, your chance of making it to be an adult is 1 in 5,000. That's not very good. So Darwin's question is, why? Why are they having so many babies? And why are so many dying? And what makes the difference? What makes the difference? What determines which German Shepherd puppies make it to be adults? Now, they have a lot of help. She's feeding them every day. She's feeding mom every day. So mom has enough milk for the babies until they're weaned. And then once they're weaned, she's feeding them herself every day until she can sell those suckers to somebody else who will feed them every day. Right? That's different. If they're in the wild, if they're in the wild, what makes the difference? Well, don't forget why is that. That's like a lead into the next state. Somebody tell me, if you're born a rainbow trout egg, you're a rainbow trout egg that hatches, what do you think will make the difference as to whether or not you make it to be an adult? What? Aren't they all kind of born in the same place in the water? Huh? Let's assume we're all born in the same place. Better yet, which ones aren't going to make it? What makes them get eaten by other fish? What? They're not fast enough, right? It's like the old joke. If the bear is chasing you in the woods, how fast do you have to be? Just faster than the person next to you. Right? So, you know, it depends on who you're with. If we're all in the woods together, I hope I'm faster than at least one of you if a bear starts chasing you. Okay, because if I am, then you're going to be lunch, and I won't. That's okay. Okay, if you're born a baby rainbow trout, how fast do you have to be as a swimmer? Just faster than somebody else. Right? Or what else? Think about fish. What color are rainbow trout? They're over here on the wall. Rainbow trout is... Up there, the second one from the top, they're kind of dark on the top, they're pink on the side, and they're white on the bottom. Why do they have that color scheme? Why aren't they all white, or all red, or all green?
agree, like a plan. Why do you think? Camouflage. That's right. What if you're born a white rainbow trout? What if you were born albino? What are your chances of surviving? Probably not very good. Why not? You're visible. Here's the theory of natural selection in a nutshell. Ready to do all this? Ready to do all this? Oh. Organisms that are fittest for their environment are, quote, selected for by nature. They will live longer and pass on their genes more often than those who aren't. This called survival of the fittest. Survival of the quote fittest. So Nemo, the rainbow trout is born. What was wrong with Nemo in the movie? One of his little pectoral fins wasn't working very well. So Nemo was, you know, daddy was really protective of Nemo, which by the way doesn't necessarily happen in fish where the parent protects the young, some fish. So anyway, Nemo has what now? If a rainbow trout is born like Nemo, he's probably not going to make it. Why not? Here comes the bigger fish to eat you, and everybody takes off swimming away, and you swim in a little circle because you can only go in one direction. So Nemo swims in his little, and he gets lunch because he can't swim very fast because his little pectoral fin doesn't work. So he swims in a circle. Okay? He is basically not as fit for his environment. You're like, well, that's kind of dumb because isn't it possible that Something gets really a big one gets eaten. Yeah, it's possible. But over time, over a long period of time, with a lot of chances, chances are, if you're born with half a fin, you are going to be lunch before somebody else. Okay. Uh, just one thing. You don't have to write the slide down, but I want to make sure you understand what we're talking about here. There are two basic kinds of characteristics. There are inherited characteristics. That's what we're talking about. Okay, what can be inherited? If it's, there are non-inherited characteristics which can decrease your fitness. For example, if you're a rabbit and you're being chased by a uh, fox and you poke your eye out with a branch, you don't see this branch, or bam, you see the eye, pokes it out. You might get away from that fox, but the chances are that you might get caught later by something else you don't see coming. All right, that would be an example of a non-inherited characteristic which can decrease your fitness. But you aren't going to, if you have your eye poked out and then you have a baby, you're not going to pass on that characteristic. You know what I mean? Or if you lift weights a lot and you've got big muscles, you aren't necessarily going to have kids with big muscles. Right? That's something you, that's a non-inherited characteristic. Inherited characteristics, like how long your bill is if you're a bird, what color your eye is if you're a human. Those are the things that can increase, that can, we're talking about here. Increase or decrease fitness. All right. So I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to give you uh, 
the idea of how evolution occurs. And I'm going to give you an example, which is not, well, you'll see. Okay. What makes something different from something else is its blank. The reason Tristan is different from his brother is that his blank is different. I mean, different in general. I heard somebody say it. Thank you, Lord. DNA. His DNA is different. So, oh, I just turned on my microphone. So, in order to get something that looks different, you would have to have a change in the DNA. We call changes in the DNA mutation. Then, of course, that mutation has to lead to a change in the whole organism. How is the whole organism different? I'll give you an example of this in a minute. If that change makes you more fit for your environment, the change remains permanent and gets passed along to the kid. Usually, there would have to be a change in the environment to cause a change in fitness, and I'll relate that to you in a second. Did you get enough sleep this weekend, day, Rebecca? Or you were sleeping until noon every day? Okay, I have Bugs Bunny on here, and for no other reason than that's the coolest rabbit I know. Let me give you an example of how evolution may have happened using a rat as our example. If we look back at uh, the fossil record, by the way, what's a fossil? Fossil? Anybody? Not Mr. Burnell, that's not very nice. What's a fossil? No, it's a fossil. I'm going to repeat this for the an animal that died a really long time ago and what? Got preserved somehow? Okay, so it's not necessarily something that lives here anymore. Right? So we looked at fossils and we found out there are many things that don't live here anymore. One thing we notice in the fossil record is that rabbits haven't always looked the way they do. Back in the day, thousands of years ago, there were rabbits, bushy tail, that had short ears. I don't know how to draw a rabbit like, but it had short ears. So let's talk about the evolution, possible evolution of a rabbit ear as the idea behind how this works. So for years and years and years, there was these, we're going to call them rabbits, but they weren't really rabbits back then because they didn't have the characteristics that rabbits do today. But this little mammal that hopped around and ate grasses and seeds, and they had these really big teeth to chop off the grasses like bugs. Okay? And uh, one day, two of those rabbits had a baby. The problem with the baby was it was uh, perfectly normal in every way, but its ears were a little taller than normal. Ears were a little taller than all the rest of them. Now, of course, 
you know that if you uh, look a little different than everybody else, you might get made fun of a lot in school. So when they went to bunny school, you get picked on. They call him Dumbo the Rabbit, you know, Dumbo, you know, nice ears, dude. You know, you clean those things with, you know, like a, like a test tube swab or something, you know, and it's, you know, and they just pick on all the time. Well, it didn't take long for this little bunny to realize something that he noticed that whenever the fox would come, like, he would always kind of hear it before everybody else. Like, he figured out that I hear it coming and I start taking off and nobody else is going anywhere yet. So he would raise the alarm for a while. Pretty soon he gets a little angry with them all. And he doesn't raise the alarm. He would just sneak off and hide. And the fox would eat his friends. Well, they're not really his friends because they made fun of him. So this happens time after time after time where he hears the fox come and sneaks off and hides before everybody else. Eventually, it's going to be him left. Well, he might tell a few of his lady friends, hey, the fox is coming, say hi. Right? And so eventually, he has lots of rabbits to mate with because he's the only one left. All the, he's the biggest year, so he mates because they do it like rabbits, you know. And so he has lots of babies. And the babies carry his genes, right? And so he has lots of babies with the bigger ears, and all those babies with bigger ears are better at getting away from the foxes, so they have babies with bigger ears, and so on. Because that change in his DNA led to a change in fitness. And then maybe uh, thousands of years go by, and you have many, many rabbits that look like this, and then the same thing happens again. And you get, well, bunnies that look like bugs with the Whoops. Here's like they have today. Same idea. Okay? It didn't happen gradually. You didn't get like slightly bigger ears and slightly bigger ears and slightly bigger ears. You had this mutation that caused bigger ears. And then you have another mutation that causes bigger ears. Thousands of years later. And now we have the bunnies you see today. Question. Why? Aren't bunny ears getting bigger? Any ideas? Why didn't bunnies develop bigger ears yet? Maybe they use them to hear predators coming and be helpful. Any other ideas? Right, but wouldn't even bigger ears help you hear the predators better? Okay, but I don't even think there might be. Why might my ears be perfect right now? If they got bigger, let's say you got bigger ears yet, and all of a sudden the fox comes, you take off running, you step on one of those suckers. Right, it's too big. <laughs> Lunch. Or maybe you're hiding down in the grass and your ears are sticking up over the grass because they're too long. So you think you're hiding, you know, like little kids, you know how little kids, like, hide behind a tree and, like, half of them is sticking out either side and you're playing hide-and-go-seek and, like, you don't, you don't think I can see you there? Little kids, you ever notice they think they're hiding if their face is covered? It's like they'll run and hide in their bed and put their pillow over their head and say, you can't see me! When you can see, like, every part of them but their face, which I think is really pretty fun. Or they'll hide, like I said, behind a tree like this and their face is covered so they can't see you, but you can see, like, every part of them around it. They think they're... That's kind of like bunny, right? He's hiding, but his ears are sticking up. So he becomes lunch. Or maybe they'd be too big for their head. They could keep it up. So, uh, and the environment they live in hasn't really changed. It really. I mean, bunnies are gray, except when you live where? Where are bunnies not gray? In the Arctic. Then you get snowshoe hairs, which are white. Part of time with their snow on the ground. All right. One thing we didn't mention that most scientists now think we have to have is something called isolation. And that is somehow they have to become separated from each other. Somehow they have to become separated from each other. And we'll come back to this idea what we call geographic isolation, where 
the bunny with bigger ears got separated from all the rest. Take out the lab we did last time. We're going to stop with those now. Take out the lab we did last time. It was the one on... Uh, see we got up here we got in the construction paper environment we got 10 20 30 40 50 60 uh, 70 82 103 and 4 37 here we got 19 and 23 is 42 here we got 30, 45, 55, 65, 75, 85, and 287. And here we got 14, 29, and 22 is 51, and 16 is 67. There's our group totals for the construction paper environment. Don't worry about total naive. Okay, for the table environment, we have 24 and 16 is 48, no, 40, 50. We have 36, 56, and 14 is 70. We have 27 and 13 is 40, 54, 65, and here we have 24 and 27, which is 54, 51, and 15 is 6. Now, I'm not sure <coughs> what happened to this group here. You might have gotten your number switched around. Two. Two. But our lab illustrates an important point about dots. If you live in the construction paper environment, what would be the most advantage to live where? To be what color, I mean? The biggest advantage is to be white. Correct? Less of you are going to get eaten. So therefore, over a long period of time, if the dots meet, and they reproduce, which ones are we going to reproduce the most in the construction paper environment? The white. Which ones are we going to reproduce the least? Black. So if we graph, I'm just going to graph this on top. Black would go up. Wrong. White would go up. Black would go down. But if the environment changed, where the table is black, now it's an advantage to be black. It's a disadvantage to be white. And the opposite happens. So being black is an advantage. You reproduce more often, pass on your genes. That's the idea of natural selection. Predators eat more black ones on a white background.
Okay? We'll come back to that lab and then again next time when we finish up with uh, why evolution is so widely thought of as a thing. Okay? The only homework for